Yes, guys. Let's discuss about share-based payments. Broadly talking about the person who receives share-based payments from a company is always an employee. But at the same time, though I call it as an employee, I am not covering this as per AS15. AS15 is accounting for employee benefits. But accounting for employee benefits does not include your share-based payments at all. Share-based payments is dealt as per a guidance note. Guidance note on share based payments issued by ICI. No AS15 coming into picture, guys. AS15 clearly specifies that it excludes share based payments. Now, these share based payments are normally given to employees. First thing that should come up why does an employee require a share based payment? Anyways, for the employee services, we pay something called as salaries, we give them some welfare expenditure, we have some allowances, we have some perquisites. We have n number of things which are allowed to an employee. I'm saying over and above that, they're also paying something called as share-based payments. Now, when how does the share-based payments even apply? And why does the share-based payments are required to be given to the employees? The first and the foremost thing that you need to understand is employee turnover ratio. What is this employee turnover ratio? It is the rate at which the employee in the organization is shifting from this organization. Now this is highest when you talk about a software industry. Whenever you see a software industry, a particular person employed with a particular project and the project com completes in one and a half year and that fellow will not look for a new project. He will look for a new company itself. Now this is the main thing that happens. Now whenever there is a high employee turnover, the productivity be becomes very very low. Always there is a steep decline in the productivity whenever a new employee is joining the organization. Because he has to adapt to the organization structure, he has to adapt to the team that is working along with him and then he needs to start his production. So definitely it will be always lower. So a company's main thing will be to reduce your employee turnover. This is the first reason why I give an additional benefit that is employee, that is your share based payments. Second thing is a motivation. Yes, you can say that you can also give bonus to increase the productivity of an employee but I am saying that more applicable than the bonus would be your share based payments because a bonus is basically only on the basis of the net profit of the organization earns but a share based payments is not just based on the net profit but it is based on the entire organization growth because the price of a share is not just dependent on your profit because your share price is determined by EPS into PE ratio so EPS is the earnings part there is a PE part as well so the PE multiple based is completely based on the solvency position of the company. So there itself you need to understand the employees always will look for a share based payments and when a company has allotted them share based payments to employee, first thing it reduces employee turnover, second thing it always enhances or motivates an employee to increase their production. Got it? These share based payments, I'll split them into two types. One is called as equity settled Other one is called as cash settled Now what is the difference when I say equity settled I have allotted shares <coughs> saying that I will allot you shares to an employee after one year at the rate of 50 rupees per share Let's say the market price on the date of allotment became 70 from 50. So there's an increase of 20. When I talk about equity settled, the employee will have to pay 50 rupees and take back the share. After he buys the share from the company, he can sell it back at 70 rupees in the open market. That is a different issue. But whenever I'm calling about equity settlement between the company and the employee, the employee has to pay the amount and then receive the share. This is called as equity settled. When I'll call it as a cash settle in a sense, instead of actually allotting the share for 50 rupees, what the company says is the company will directly pay him 20 rupees. The market price per share was 70. Anyways, you had to pay 50 to take up the share. I'll only give you 20 rupees. That is a net settlement. So, these equity settle schemes are called as ESOPs. 
these cash settle schemes are called as SAR. ESOP stands for Employee Share Option Plan. SAR is Stock Appreciation Right. This is an option. This is the right, guys. Both are different. It's an option because if the company, if the employee does not want to exercise the option, does not want to pay that 50 rupees, even though the market price might be 70, he does not have 50 rupees in his pocket. He need not exercise it. There is no compulsion. It's at the option of the employee. But here, no employee says a no because a directly is receiving cash. So who will say a no when someone is receiving cash? So normally, this is called as a right. You cannot call these are options. They are rights. So these are the two schemes that we talk about. One is the ESOP and SAR. We need to look at accounting for both. But before understanding the accounting, we need to understand the framework of how these ESOPs are allotted and on what basis are they getting even distributed to the employees. Now, when we are discussing about ESOPs or we are to discuss about either of these because the accounting treatment is same. Accounting treatment is almost the same except the settlement entries. Here the settlement is in shares, here the settlement is in cash. That is the only settlement entry which differs. Otherwise, the remaining entries for both the schemes are always the same. Now, normally what happens, a basic ESOP happens something like this. Let's say a person enters the organization on 1st April 2015, let's say. Now, I cannot allot him shares on that date itself. If something like that happens, on 1st April 2015, I entered the organization and the management said, I will allot you 100 shares. I take the 100 shares, 2nd April, I'll sell those shares, 3rd April, I'll resign and I'll get out of it. Ultimately, I've made profit on those 100 shares. So, no one is going to allot you shares on the date of your appointment itself. So, what I'll say is, I'll say that I've announced a right on this day. I've announced a plan on this day saying that, if you stay in the organization with a continuous employment up to 31st March 2018, that is three continuous years, then I will say that you are entitled to this plan. You are entitled to the plan. What is the plan? The plan says, I will give you 1000 options. Each one can be exercised at 50 rupees per share. Whatever might be the market price on 31st March, I am saying that your plan is 1000 options exercisable at 50 rupees per option. That means even on 31st March, the share price might be 1000 also, he is still liable to pay only 50 rupees per share. Now, as on 31st March, exactly on 31st March, I can't say, employee, come give that 50 rupees, not possible. Because there is some liquidity you have to think about. Because 1000 options into 50 rupees is approximately 50,000. Now, his employee's salary might not be so huge that he can liquidate, or he can actually make available 50,000 funds aside. So, what the company tries to do is, I'll give you a small window. Let's say I'll give it up to 31st March. 31st March 2019, I'll give you a small window, I'll say that whatever shares you got allotted, whatever shares you are eligible to apply on 31st March, you have to apply it before one year, that is 31st March 2019. So these 1000 shares, that 50,000 whatever you have to pay, you can pay it between these two dates, starting from 1st April 2018 up to 31st March 2019, at any point of time you can pay them out. What about after 31st March 2019? After 31st March 2019, the scheme is not anymore applicable. So, I cannot exercise the shares at all. Got it? Now, going by this scheme, I will say that this day, 1st April 2015, is called as grand date. These 1000 options are called as Number of options granted at 
and this 50 rupees is called as exercise price. What is the condition that is put up? 3 years of continuous employment. This continuous employment is called as vesting condition. I will call it as vesting condition because on satisfaction of this vesting condition, this options granted will vest. Otherwise, I cannot exercise these options at all. So, I will call them as vesting condition. How many years should I satisfy this vesting condition for? 3 continuous years. This 3 years is called as vesting period. This one year which is attached to the vesting period is an extension. We call this as exercise period. This 31st March 2018 that you see here is called as date of vesting. This entire period from 1st April up to 31st March 2019 covering 4 years is called as contractual life of option. Understand this. I will construct my accounting only on based on this example. So, they have granted options to a particular employee or particular set of employees. Let's say I will say that all those people who are holding a managerial post or assistant managerial post are eligible to be allotted 1000 options at the rate of 50 rupees per share if they satisfy 3 years of vesting conditions from the date of grant. So, I have granted them on 1st April 2015. My continuous employment for 3 years will lapse on 31st March 2018. This 1000 options which are granted to each of such employee are called as number of options granted and each option is exercisable at 50 rupees which is called as exercise price. The condition which should be satisfied that is a continuous employment period is vesting condition. How many years should I do continuous employment? 3 years. The 3 years the period of vesting and at the completion of the third year the date on 31st March 2018 will be called as date of vesting. From the date of vesting I will extend the period for, so that the options vested can be exercised. So this is called as exercise period and finally at the end of 31st March 2019 the contractual life of option closes. Got it? Now think from a company's perspective and tell me what is the loss that the company is making or what is the expenditure that they are incurring by issuing such option. What is the loss that the company is making? Understand, when did I allot shares? 31st March 2018 up to 31st March 2019 between this one year at any particular day the company is liable to at when, whenever he makes the payment of 50,000 the company is liable to give him 1000 shares. Now let's say for suppose during this period the company share on the date of vesting has jumped to 85 rupees per share. Okay. Let's say for suppose it has become 85 rupees per share. Now understand on 31st March 2018 I am allotting the share to the employee at what price? 50. But if the company would have issued the shares to the public, then it would have issued at its fair value and my fair value of the share being 85 rupees. Then understand, for every share the company is losing 35 rupees. For every share allotted to the employee, the company could have got extra 35 rupees from each share. So that is what the company is losing. And this we normally call in economic terms as opportunity cost. It's an opportunity cost. Though in you know, preliminary sections of you know, chapters when we enter the commerce field, we have identified that you know, we normally see that there is no opportunity cost which is accounted. There is one place which stands as an exception where we account on, we record 
for the opportunity loss. There is an opportunity loss of 35 rupees per share and we have to start recording for it. Now the question arises, when is that loss? The loss is arising on the day when the share is allotted. When is the share allotted? Last one year. Any, period, any day during the last one year, the share is allotted. And on that day, the company is actually incurring loss. But if you understand, the company was aware about this loss on the day of grant itself. On the day when he granted the shares itself, the company knows that the share price will be higher. And definitely I will be incurring an opportunity loss by allotting the share at a lower exercise price. I know this. At the date of grant itself. So a past event, it is giving rise to a future liability. If it can be determined reliably, then I can create a provision or I have to create a provision in the books of accounts. Now on what basis? The most unfortunate part is, I don't know this 85 rupees per share unless and until I reach this date 31st March 2018. Standing on the grand date that is 1st April 2015, if someone will ask me what is the market price per share on 31st March 2018, I am not aware about it. I have zero knowledge of what would be the market price per share in the future. Now, this is the problem which arises. It is highly difficult for any company to measure and identify what could be the future market price of share. So now, even though we do not have this 85 rupees per share, we are saying that there is a loss which I know. I cannot measure it reliably, but I know that there is a loss on 1st April 2015. How much amount of loss the company does not know? No idea about what could be the amount of loss. But such loss which is arising during this period, what we say is, we have to provide it from the date of grant. Up to how many years from this date, up to this date, three years, the entire loss should be written off in equal proportions. That means, let's say the loss was, let's say it, let, it was 80 rupees. If it was 80 rupees, then what was the loss? 30 rupees per share. How many years wasting is there? Three years. So what I'll do? I'll provide 10, 10, 10 in first year, second year and third year. And that is how we do it. But like I told you, I don't know this market price. What is the market price on this day? This I don't know. Then I have to measure. For measurement of this, we use something called as fair value of option. What is a fair value of option? Fair value of option is estimated market price per share on date of vesting, minus exercise price per share under option. Now, how do I get this estimated market price per share minus exercise price? This fair value will be calculated as per your financial models. They are called as option pricing models. You have plenty of option pricing models guys, binomial model, blacks and scores model, all those are called as your option pricing models. So, however, you can chill and relax as far as this chapter is concerned because the question always gives you the fair value. You don't have to calculate the fair value by applying any particular method, but understand his computation of fair value is based on option pricing mode. Let's say for suppose we do not have fair value per option. We are not supplied with this information of fair value per option. Then still I will provide the loss based on something called as intrinsic value of option. I will still continue to provide the loss based on intrinsic value of option. Intrinsic value of option, I will change the formula slightly. Market price per share on date of grant minus exercise price.
what did I change? Instead of taking market price per share estimated on the date of vesting, I am taking the figure which I have now. I will have definitely this figure market price on date of grant because I am granting the share. I definitely have an idea about what is the market price when I granted the share. So market price per share on the date of grant minus exercise price is an intrinsic value of option. Is it a correct valuation? No. But in absence of fair value, we can use a reliable estimate that is intrinsic value. Because this is based on estimate, but your intrinsic value is based on actual figures. Based on complete actual figures here. Now, what is the accounting treatment that we suggested? Though the actual loss is during this period from 31st March 2018 to 2000, 31st March 2019, I am saying that such a loss arises because the options were granted on 1st April 2015. So, whatever loss you are estimating to be incurred during this period, I will split it into small portion, equal proportions during the vesting period. That is your accounting treatment. Got it? So let's take down here layer. We'll come back to the accounting treatment.
Yes, guys, what is the loss to company? Loss to company is number of options granted multiplied by either you have the fair value or the intrinsic value. So, fair value or intrinsic value of option. This can be called as loss to company. Accounting treatment loss to company should be allocated to PNL over the period of vesting allocated to PNL proportionately over the period of vesting This is the accounting treatment that we can apply. Whatever loss to the company that you have observed, such loss to the company should be allocated to P&L proportionately over the period of vesting. Vesting period is 3 years. Whatever loss is there, I will break it into 3 proportionates. That is 1 by 3, 1 by 3 and 1 by 3. Right until then, I will pick up a new concept here. Yes, guys, all in all, we were missing one small concept here. Let's say there were 100 people who were of that assistant manager rank whom we thought that we are allotting 1000 options per employee. Now, you can't expect everyone to complete 3 years employment. Not possible. There could be some people who have got some better offers or due some other reason. He is exiting the company within this 3 years continuous employment. Then definitely he is not entitled to the options at all. So, whenever we are talking about such type of employees, this is one type of employees who will, whom we will call it as lapse of option. We will call them by the word lapse of option. So, when can an option lapse? First thing, when a person is leaving the organization within the period of vesting. This is one case where the options can lapse. And the second condition for the lapse is, let's say he has continued for 3 years, let's say the options were vested to him on 31st March 2019, but 
if he did not pay the amount within this one year period, after one year, even if he comes with the payment, the options cannot be excised because there is one more lapse towards the end. So there are two lapses when we talk about. The first lapse, if the vesting condition is not satisfied, Or second one, if the vested options are not exercised, until the end of exercise period. So, when there is a lapse of option, to that extent of the options, I am not incurring any loss. Because unless and until the options are exercised, the company does not incur a loss. If an option is lapsing in between, the company has never incurred lo a loss on those options lapse. So, one correction which we genuinely made is this part. Now, tell me what is the correction. Loss to the company is number of options... This is wrong. It is not number of options granted because sometimes there can be a lapse. If there is a lapse, to that extent the company has never incurred a loss. So I will say number of options exercised. Only for those options exercised into the fair value or intrinsic value of options will give you what is a loss to a company. But unfortunate thing is, we will not know what is the number of options exercised until we reach this date. Until we reach that date, I do not have an idea of how many options are going to be exercised at all. Because I am trying to create the laws as a provision between the first three periods. But the number of options exercised will be after 31st March 2018. So until then, how will you create a loss to that period? So what we will try to do is, we will try to estimate the lapses. He will give you an estimate saying that I am expecting 15 employees to lapse before the end of the vesting itself. Got it? So whenever such a thing is given, then we have to use the information. Sometimes he will say that 2% of the options granted will lapse at the end of each year. So we can use that information as well. So there will be something which will be given in the you know question, which is indicating you what could be the lapses during this 3 years period. Got it? So if there is no adjustment given, then he is not expecting any lapse. Hypothetical situation guys. You won't get such a situation. Let's see the accounting entries then. Simple accounting entries guys. Date of grant. Date of grant is not even a transaction guys. Okay. Your company is allotting shares. Allotting the options. But the company is not receiving anything in return. So I cannot say that there is a transaction here. Transaction should involve a give and take. Not possible. What can I record? I am recording a loss to the company. When am I recording? Proportionately over the period of vesting. That means, if I have granted the options on, on 1st April 2015, 
For 2015-16 also I have to record a loss. For 2016-17 also I have to record a loss. For 2017-18 also I have to record a loss. Such recording of losses is a provisional loss. When is the actual loss? When the option is vested. Until then we are only trying to estimate the loss and creating it as a provision. And every provision should be created only on balance sheet date. So my accounting entry will start only with the balance sheet dates up to vesting. Up to the vesting period, every balance sheet date, 31st March 2016, 31st March 2017, 31st March 2018, three entries, three years. The entry that we pass is employee compensation expense account debit to employee stock option outstanding this is a nominal account and this is a personal account. It's an expense. Expense are always nominal. It's a provision. Such a provision which is maintained for an employee. I'll call it as a personal account. All nominal accounts should be transferred to p &L at the end of the year. So p &L account debit. To employee compensation expense. Now, I'll continue these two entries for three balance sheet dates. Once three balance sheet dates are over, that is 31st March is over, then what do we have to do? I have to pass exercise dates. Because there is an exercise period, that is 31st March 2018 to 31st March 2019, where the options vested can be exercised. Exercise of options. When the option is exercised, entry is, I am receiving cash to the extent of exercise price, bank account debit. This is for exercise price. Because the, each employee has to pay that 50 rupees first. Then I am saying another debit to whatever loss we have created. We have created the loss as a provision. Now I am utilizing the provision debit the provision either for fair value or intrinsic value whatever the case might be what am I allotting him? I am allotting him equity shares so get equity share capital and they will be allotted it as premium then you get securities premium as well. Always put the premium as balancing figure it will be easier. Now whatever entries I have given just now is for employee stock option plan. What if, what if it was a stock appreciation right? If it was a stock appreciation right, then this provision name will change. Since these are options, I wrote it as employee stock option outstanding. They were stock appreciation rights. So I'll write it as stock appreciation right outstanding. That doesn't make any difference. Instead of writing this entry like this, I'll write SAR outstanding account. Can you give me the exercise option for cash title scheme? What happens in SAR? The net amount is paid in cash. So whatever provision is there, I'll happily pay off in cash. Entry is SAR outstanding account debit to cash.
whatever loss you created, that is the amount of cash payment, that's it. Yes, guys, now think about accounting treatment for labs. What is the first type of a labs? Where the vesting condition is not satisfied, such options might be lapsed. Now, do I have to record a separate accounting entry for that? What I'll say is not required. Let's say, for suppose, I had 100 options. I had 100 options. Basically, each one had an exercise, you know, uh, intrinsic value or a fair value of 60 rupees. So, what is the total provision required? 100 options into 60 rupees, 6000 rupees. Let's say I was providing it for 3 years. So how much I will provide every year to 2000, to 2000 I will provide. First year I provided 2000. We came to the second, second year. 100 options already 20 are out. Already 20 options have lapsed. So how many options are remaining? 80. What is the intrinsic value? Intrinsic value I said is 60 rupees. So 80 into 60 is only 4800. How many years completed? 2 years. First year I made a provision on the entire 100. Now I have to make a provision only on 80 shares. Now think about it. 80 into 60, 4,800. Out of 3 years, already 2 years is over. So what do we write? 4,800 into 2 by 3 should be provided. How much should be provided? One third in the first year and one third in the second year. 4 by 4,800 into 1 by 3 is how much? 1,600. So 1,600 plus 1,600. Basically the total what I have to provide is 3,200. How much did you provide in the first year? First year I did not know about the labs. So I provided two, uh, entire 2000. So second year I will provide only balance 1200. So what I will try to do is I will keep revising the provision. I will keep revising the provision based on it. That is what we normally do for any provision. Provision for bad debt is put up at 5%. Very good. So does it mean that the bad debt should be 5%? Not necessary at all. 
let's say bad debt was provision for bad debt was 100 rupees opening provision was 100 closing provision required was 150 bad debt during the year was 40 rupees then what do we do 100 rupees provision which means 40 rupees should be nullified saying that that 40 rupees is the bad debt so what is the balance provision 60 what is the closing provision required 150 how much provision will you create 90 same thing compare the opening provision with the closing provision the difference should be the provision to be created in the current year I will not record an entry separately for the lapse during the period of creating the provision that means during the vesting period if any lapse is there I will not record any entry no entry for lapse of option during vesting period no entry means I'm not treating it no I am treating it but what do we do adjust or adjusted against loss to be provided in the current year but what is the second lapse Second lap is of those options which were vested but they were not excised. When did you create the provision? From 1st April 2015 to 31st March 2018. For whatever options are vested, I am assuming them to be exercised and I am creating a provision during this 3 years. But when did you know about the second lapse? At the end of 31st March 2019. That means, as on the day when I was creating the provision, I did not have any idea about that. The, uh, you know these lapses, which are going to happen at the end of 31st March 2019. That means, let's say there were totally 80 options which were vested. I create a provision on entire 80, but let's say only 75 are exercised. Then, for those five shares or five options which are unexercised, also I create a provision. Now, where is the provision stored? Employee stock option outstanding account. These options are labs now. So how do we record the entry? We'll have to reverse the entry. Whatever entry is there, just put it all down. Employee stock option. Outstanding account debit. credit to do not take it to employee compensation expense because it is a nominal account when did you create this nominal account up to 31st March 2018 every year I created but when are you recording this current entry it is a lapse at the end of the exercise period as on that day I don't have any employee compensation expense at all it is a profit but directly take it to general reserve do not impact the PNL in any way extraordinary non trade item guys though yeah it is a profit but it is extraordinary non-trade item, so I don't want to put it to PNL. I'll directly take it to general reserve. This is the entry for lapse of option, lapse of vested options, unexercised. Lapse of vested options unexercised. We record this entry. So we have seen two lapses. One, if the vesting condition is not satisfied. Two, when the options are vested, but the exercise period is completed and he did not pay the amount of exercise. So exercise price was not paid. Even those people, I will not I, you know, allot the shares. They'll call me. They are called as lapse of options. So for the first type of a lapse where the vesting condition is not satisfied, I will not record any entry only. But for the second type of lapse, when the vested options are not exercised up to the end of the exercise period, I have already created a provision for such options as well. So such option, such provision which is created should be reversed. So and I am crediting it to general reserve.
Western conditions need not be so simple also. Western conditions will go to the extent of saying that if the net profit of the company reaches 14%, 16% I'll allot. Okay, so based on some of the other conditions, he'll be putting it. If my number of employees in the organization have increased beyond 1000, then I'll allot options. My wish, whatever language I want, I'll put. Western condition is that the option of the company who is granting the options. So they'll have their own Western conditions there. Obviously, which makes sense. Simple accounting entries, guys. The crux of the entire questions will be based on how do you create the amount of provision, how do you calculate the provision every year. Once you get the calculation of provision, same entry what you are recording all the time. Will there be a lapse of options in stock appreciation rights? Lapse of rights. Can that happen? It can happen during the vesting period if the vesting condition is not satisfied. But it cannot happen at the end of the vesting period because there is no exercise in that. The company has to pay cash, they will pay cash. Let's see the first question, question number one. APC grants 1000 employee stock options on 14-2008 at 40 rupees. So 1000 is the number of options granted, 14-2008 is the grant day. 40 is the exercise price. Market price is 160. Vesting period is two and a half years. Exercise period is one year. 300 unvested options lapsed on 1-5-2010 and 600 were exercised on 36-2011. 100 vested options lapsed at the end of the exercise period. Pass the journal entries with suitable narrations. When do when we have such a question, how do we start recording for it? Guys, the entire question is not about your recording entries, guys. Entries anyone will write. It is the amount that you prefix or, you know, that is there at the entry. What is the amount of a provision to be created every year during the vesting period? Check. When was the option granted? Options was granted on? 1408 grand date 1408 options granted 1000 Exercise price 40. Market price per share was 160. When I know the market price and the exercise price, I can calculate what is intrinsic value. Intrinsic value of option. Market price minus exercise price 120. Market price per share minus exercise price. And finally, vesting period being two and a half years. Come on, guys. If the grant date is 1408, then when do I record my first entry? On the first balance sheet date after your date of grant. What is the first balance sheet date after your date of grant? Now, this is very careful. Be very careful with this, guys. The first entry to be recorded on 31st March 09. Second entry, next to balance sheet date, 31st March 2010. I don't need next balance sheet date because my vesting period is only two and a half years. So, I'll take this as 30th September 2010. Now, check. Always start with number of options expected to vest. Or you can call it as number of options outstanding also. Options expected to vest actually makes sense. First year, I have the entire thousand options. 
Even on the second balance sheet date, I have 1000 options. But continue reading. In the third line, he says 300 unvested options lapsed on 1-5-2010. 1-5-2010 is the last 6 months period where 300 unvested options are lapsed. So the balance options expected to vest are only 700. What is the intrinsic value? Intrinsic value of option is 120. Multiply, you will get what is the total loss. Already seen the formula, loss to company is number of options expected to best into intrinsic value or fair value. Here I have intrinsic value, so 1,20,000, 1,20,000 and 84,000. How many years should I provide this loss over the vesting period? Vesting period is two and a half years. Vesting period is two and a half years. Yes guys, once you know the vesting period, now you need employee compensation expense. Come on. How do we calculate this employee compensation expense? Employee compensation expense. Let's split this into three parts now. Employee compensation expense on a cumulative basis. Minus less already provided in the previous year this will give us a balance to be provided in the current year that is what we want that is the amount of provision to be recorded in the current year let's continue Come on. first Cumulative basis, how many years are over? One year is completed out of two and a half years. So if my total employee compensation is 1,20,000, my cumulative is 1 by 2.5. Second year, 1,20,000 total loss. Two years are over out of two and a half years, 2 by 2.5. Last year, 84,000 loss into 2.5 by 2.5. 1 by 2.5 is 48,000. 2 by 2.5 is 96,000. Last one, same figure you get because numerator and denominator of 2.5, 2.5 gets cancelled. First year, what is provided in the previous year? Nothing. This is the first year. So, provision to be created is 48,000. Year 2, already provided in the previous year, 48,000. Current year provision required is 96. So, my provision to be provided in the current year is only 48. 48 provided in the first year, 48 provided in the second year. What is the total provision? 96,000. 96 already provided in the previous year. How much do you need? Only 84. That means I have a negative 12,000 rupees here. That means the provision was excess. So we will write back the provision to the extent of those 12,000 on the date of vesting. These 300 options labs were on 30th in May 2010. That means giving the balance sheets on 31st March 2009 and 2010, I did not know that there was a lapse. Okay, the labs are identified only in the month of May. So we did not know the labs was on the other two balance sheet dates.
Record the entries now. Journal entries in the books of ABC Limited. Take down that and then record the entries. Journal entries in the books of ABC Limited. First date on 31st March 2009. 31st March 2009. Employee compensation expense account debit to employee stock option outstanding account. First year, how much amount? 48,000. Two entries every year because this employee compensation expense should be transferred to PNL. The entries will be same on 31st March 2010. Same two entries. Record the entries guys. Both the entries again. When we are doing 31st March 2010. <sighs> My next entry date is 30th September 2010. I have a negative provision. So write off the provision. Employee stock option outstanding. Account debit to general reserve. Don't give it to employee compensation expense. Employee compensation expense is a nominal account which is closed every year. Finally come to the exercise entry. Six hundred options were exercised on thirty six two thousand eleven. 100 unvested options, 100 vested options lapsed at the end of exercise period. How many options actually vested? 700. But on 36, 2011, only 600 options were exercised. 36, 2011. Come on. Let's go for the entry now. Exercise entry. Bank account debit. First, he will receive the exercise price. How many options? 600 options. Excise price per option is 40 rupees 24,000. Debit the provision. We are utilizing the provision. Employee stock options outstanding. Six hundred into one twenty intrinsic value. 
to equity share capital each share is 10 rupees so 600 6000 Securities premium can be taken as a balancing figure. $90,000. This is my exercise entry. Instead of calling securities premium as a balancing figure, I can also say that the market price per share is 160. Face value is 10, then the premium is 150. 150 into 6000 is 90,000. What is the end of the exercise period? When did the options vest? 30th September 2010. What is he saying? With the vested option, they have an exercise period of 1 year. That means I can exercise these options before 30th September 2011. But however I did not. So on 30th September 2011, that is the end of the exercise period, 100 options which were vested were unexercised. Check what are the number of options vested? 700. How many options exercised? 600. That means 100, unvest, 100 vested options are unexercised. Same entry I'll record. Employee compensation expense. I'm sorry. Employee stock option outstanding. Employee stock option outstanding account. How many options? 100 options. Each one I created a provision for 120. Credited to general reserve, 12,000. That is it for the accounting entries. Check once, how much employee stock option outstanding did you provide in the first year? 48. Second year, 48. 96. Third year, I debited it by 12. So 96 will become 84. Out of 84, on exercise, I utilize 72,000. How much balance left on? 12,000. The 12,000 is written off to general reserve. At the end of your third, of 30th September 2011, you will observe that your employee stock option outstanding account will become 0.